Good. Perfect. Good evening. I'm Susan Armstrong, moderator for this evening program. I'm a member of the Green Party in Missouri, and I was raised on a farm, believe it or not. I'm a civil engineer. My specialty is health, safety, and environmental engineering. So tonight, we're going to talk about agriculture as a weapon of domination. It's time to take action against corporate methods of agriculture, which poison the food our families eat, threaten the survival of soil ecosystems, destroy the livelihoods of farmers, crush farm workers, organizing efforts, and subjugate entire countries. Cultivation of annual grain crops inevitably degrades the soil and depletes the organic matter. South African colonialism wrecks the economy of the colonized, especially true with regards to food deserts. In India, small and marginal, marginal farmers suffer commercialization on the countryside. In the US, conditions of farm workers go from daily abuse through wage theft to modern day slavery. We're very fortunate this evening to have four speakers, um, international speakers. And I'd like to first introduce the first speaker, Wes Jackson. Wes Jackson is a co-founder of the Land Institute, has a doctorate in genetics from North Carolina State University, and has written several books, including Hogs Are Up, Story from the Land with Degradation, Degradations. Wes? Oh, yeah. Well, hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to say welcome to Salina, Kansas, uh, in our own way. Um, agriculture as a weapon of domination uh, is a story that is 10,000 years old. And uh, once we started that journey, we creatures of the upper Paleolithic that had been around with the big brain as Homo sapiens, something like um, 200,000 years, uh, they're at the eastern end of the Mediterranean where it's drying out at the end of the Pleistocene uh, is where the greatest group of revolutionaries to ever exist came onto the scene and began the big split between humans and nature. Uh, the hoe, the plow, and then later the industrialized products of the, the industrial revolution. So uh, uh, we didn't know it. We, our ancestors didn't know it, but they really were starting a Ponzi scheme that ever since that um, early stage, which all well, they were trying to do is to get some food, uh, they didn't know that they were getting at the young pulverized coal of the soil that when they got the organic matter out of that soil, it could then be allocated to the seeds. Uh, and here we had things that did not uh, rot and they could be stored and they could be eventually metrical devices for money. Uh, Jim Scott's uh, spoken to this. <coughs> so here we are. Uh, what do you do when you're in a Ponzi scheme where every year you have to <clears throat> keep ratcheting it up? More food, um, then more um, cultivation. And here we are now at almost 8 billion. And uh, here we are now with 420 parts per million in the atmosphere which is a result of that journey of the highly dense uh, carbon. First, it was that, uh, what I called the young pulverized coal of the soil. Well, then there was the Bronze Age uh, and the Iron Age and the forests were used to smelt the ore. And then of course the coal, the oil, the natural gas. Uh, we are addicted to this. Um, it's more than addiction. It's right at the core of probably the origin of life. So uh, we at the land um, back in 77 began a journey to deal somewhat with this problem. 
because essentially all of our high yielding crops, all of our high yielding crops of, of the grains, something like 70% of our calories worldwide and something like 70% of our um, um, soils of our agriculture are those grains. And so uh, what do we do? Well, what we did in noting that most of those were annuals, which meant that we had to tear the ground up every year. And in the tearing up of the ground, of course, we have soil erosion. And so the very ecological capital that has given rise to our large numbers has been eroding. And what we do is offset that with fertilizers. But uh, those fertilizers, of course, highly dense carbon for the commercial fertilizer. So this Ponzi scheme uh, is about over. And uh, the question is, what do you do uh, in the midst of it all? And uh, so the, uh, uh, the um, Robert Jensen and I, he's uh, Meredith's professor of the University of Texas, have been thinking about this and have done a book called The Old Future is Gone. And now we have to rethink how to downpower and to live without that highly dense carbon. Um, so we can, um, <clears throat> I think we have a great opportunity to rethink who we are. And I think we can take a lot with us. We have uh, what we take with us, though, is going to require a whole different way of being in the world. I think we can take the knowledge that the astrophysicists have given us, that the various scientists have given us, that the social, political, economic uh, world has taught us. And um, uh, I think it's important to us, though, to be mindful that, um, uh, that beating the swords into plowshares, which is at the United Nations, um, we need to know that the plowshare has destroyed more options for future generations than the sword. And so here we are, uh, I think, uh, in a brand new world of thought and doing. So I'll call it right there. Thanks, Wes. You said some, some things, amazing things. And again, as an Iowa farmer, um, growing up, you talked about uh, annuals that tear up the ground, annual crops and tearing up the ground every year. And there's a there's a guy, Frank Lawrence. He's a, was grew up on a Minnesota farm, and I'm sure he witnessed it just as as I did. But we'll have comments at the end. Thanks very much, Mr. Jackson, Dr. Jackson. I'm going to move to the second speaker, and that is. The second speaker is, is going to be a video. Uh, he wasn't able to join us. It's three o'clock in the morning, his time. It's Asa Ampu. He had a pre recorded movie um, and he's from Africa, occupied South Africa. He was born in 1992, became a revolutionary in 2013, and joined with the Uru movement to spread the message that colonized people must overturn colonism in every possible way. Joe, can you bring us the movie, the video? Salute, Uhuru. All power to the people, black power to the African community. I'd like to, first of all, give thanks to the Green Party and the leadership of the Green Party. Uh, to the comrades who were allowing us to get in touch, uh, Brothers Dawn and uh, all of the party. I just wanna appreciate that. We just wanna thank you on behalf of the African People's Socialist Party. I wanna thank my leadership, uh, Chairman Omari Yeshitela, uh, Ona Zine Yeshitela, uh, Secretary General Luizi Kinshasa, uh, Dr. Aisha Fields, who is my direct leadership in UPDEP. And I want to thank the class, the African working class, 
um, for creating all these resources for us to be able to be in touch with each other and have this discussion, as well as all the attending participants. Um, my name is Asa, Somali and Pu. I am a revolutionary from the townships of South Africa, occupied as Ania, uh, and I am someone who joined the Uhuru movement about nine years ago and learned through that how to struggle successfully against colonialism and capitalism without playing into the hands of the system. I have been asked by uh, the UPDEP director, Sister Fields, uh, to build this organization in South Africa. And it has been an honor because I know that this is a nonprofit that has always had a great legacy for leading programs on the ground since 2007. So I just want to say that as a background to what our organization is about. Um, Africa and African people are colonized. The African People Socialist Party uh, is an organization that has exposed this as a line of march uh, since 1972. You know, it has always showed us that the main contradiction for black people is colonialism and capitalism is a product of colonialism which feeds and sustains colonialism even through neo-colonialism and so every contradiction that we're talking about must be contextualized within that understanding uh, the party used dialectical materialism as a tool in order to reach this understanding you see and therefore uh, we created uh, chairman omali Ishitela. Uh, created the first uh, philosophy for colonized workers. Uh, it's called African internationalism. It informs all our programs and practices in the organization, in the movement, as well as our programs in the black community. And so I'd like to go into the discussion now and say that um, on the topic of agriculture as a weapon of domination, um, agriculture is you know a method for human survival historically it has been a method for human survival it is not immune however as a method uh, to colonialism and uh, to parasitic capitalism these things colonialism and parasitic uh, capitalism sometimes is synonymous with the word white power not to be confused with white supremacy but white power which is colonialism which is physical which is real whereas supremacy is a state of mind, it's a feeling, it's racism, right? Yeah, so we are talking about the material factor, which is uh, colonialism. And uh, this is how, you know, uh, under colonialism, agriculture has been turned into a weapon of, agri uh, of domination, you know? Yeah, it has been turned into a method of domination because domination, colonial domination, produces something that will sustain it including education, including uh, health care, including um, military or state apparatus, as well as an agricultural uh, system, you see. So uh, this topic suggests that there's a hierarchy that sees a minor social force dominating the masses through agriculture, food deserts, and the unaffordability of uh, healthy foods for African workers. We have to be... Uh, honest about the fact that people who can afford this food, when we talk of agri agriculture as a weapon of domination, people who can afford this food are usually people who are not dominated. Can we agree on that? People who can be able to access these resources, uh, agricultural uh, benefits, are people who are not colonized. The colonized are the ones who suffer the brunt of agricultural domination. So we talk about uh, you know how on the African continent, white people have presented themselves as agriculturalists, but have had no history with agriculture at this level until they colonized us. So Europeans, before they came and got to Africa and took uh, our, our people away from our land and took our land away from us, uh, they had no great knowledge of agriculture, right? So it gave them colonialism, colonial domination, right, gave them access to land as well as time because now somebody else was going to be working for them. We were, 
right? As well as human labor. That's what we're talking about. Consequently, this has seen uh, the case in the same case in the Americas. I watched a documentary once and I saw um, a Spanish man speaking about how indigenous people uh, are, 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 you know, an impediment to the agricultural uh, development in, in America and how they should be thankful that the white Spaniards came here and, and the Anglo-Saxons came here claiming that they are the legitimate uh, farmers. And this is a justification of colonial domination of indigenous people as well as African people. Ergo, the land is losing its fertility due to the market-driven industries created by the cre uh, relations of production resulting from colonialism and slavery. The nutrients in the soil are waning and all this system can do is hide behind genetic modification of crops instead of solving the real contradictions, colonialism and parasitic capitalism. That's the main source. The All African People's, Social, uh, All African People's Development and Emp uh, Empowerment Project recognizes that the social system built on the enslavement and theft of our land and labor can only be effectively brought down by reversing the enslavement and theft of our labor, do you understand? And so um, the people, how do they get involved in that? The people have to take power by being involved in the process of production and reproduction. And that's how we make the African revolution. That's how we solve the problem of agricultural domination. In the United States, we have created community gardens uh, in the African community of Houston, Texas, uh, in the Fifth Ward specifically, and in Huntsville, Alabama. There have also been uh, educational spaces where we invite agronomists and other professional agriculturalists to come and volunteer to educate our community and give the skills that they've acquired in their education and profession. In Sierra Leone, we were engaged in agricultural programs, natal care programs, as well as the creation of rainwater harvesting technologies because we recognized that no colonial government will ever serve the colonized. They cannot serve us, these governments. And this is the same case that we took on in South Africa, where we created uh, Project Tutukani because waste management is an issue. Unemployment is an issue. And all these things happen because of what? Colonial domination. So we say that we would like to close uh, 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 on this issue by saying that agricultural domination is not immune to colonial effects, to colonial domination. Therefore, we can defeat it by defeating what? The main source. UPDEP is a membership-based organization in the United States, as well as in South Africa. And we would like to call anyone who has any skills in the fields of agriculture, health, education, etc., to please join us at developmentforafrica.org. I'll say it again online, development for Africa.org and offer your skills for the uh, for the service and liberation of our people you know so that's how you can get involved and contact us at updep and join us uh, whether you are in the United States whether you're in South Africa or anywhere else in the world um, lastly you know just before we close and I'm very appreciative of the time that we were given I would like to say thank you to the Green Party and its steadfast leadership for, its, uh, qu for this qualitative, impactful discussion within our nation, because this is what's going to help inform our people and help us get closer to liberation. All power to the people, black power to the African community. Free all Africa and African people. Uhuru. Uhuru means freedom. Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you. This is Susan. Now, Dr. Aisha Fields is on. She'll be able to answer any questions or comments that we have regarding Asunapu's presentation. She's a director. She's the international director of All African People's Development and Empowerment Project, and uh, which builds dual power programs in African communities worldwide. So she'll be available to speak, have any questions at the end of the speakers. Our next speaker is Nellie Rodriguez. She's a leader of the Coalition of Imoki Workers. She conducts worker rights education in the fields of farm, farms participating in the fair food programs, hosts daily radio shows, receives abuse complaints, 
manages wage theft claims and investigates cases of modern day slavery. Her interpreter for this evening is Marley Monticello. Nellie, Ms. Rodriguez. Okay, déjame. Ahí, ahí me escucha, Maru? Ajá, ya todos se escuchan. la presentación y yo te traduzco. Okay, yo no te escucho. A ver, ahora. Escucha? Ahora me escuchas? Un poquito, espérame. A ver ahí. Ahora me escuchas? Muy bajito. Está bien, yo, yo voy a estar traduciendo. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Okay. So tú puedes hablar y nomás uh, cuando pausas yo te traduzco. Pues primero eh, agradecer a todos, ¿verdad? Buenas noches. Aquí son buenas noches. No sé dónde son todas las personas, pero buenas noches a todos ustedes y agradecer por la invitación y el tiempo que nos dan para compartir un poquito lo que es el trabajo que hacemos aquí en la coalición de trabajadores de Mocali. Y bueno, mi nombre es Nelly Rodríguez. So hello everyone, good evening. I don't know where everyone is, but for us, it's very much the evening. Um, so my name is Nelly Rodriguez and I work with the Coalition of Amakli Workers. Bueno, para empezar, eh, quisiera primero compartir un poquito quiénes somos. Que somos una organización de derechos humanos, una organización que fue fundada y creada por trabajadores agrícolas en los años noventas. Es una organización sin fines de lucro y la mayoría de nuestros eh, trabajadores son trabajadores del campo. Muchos son eh, guatemaltecos, mexicanos, haitianos, uh, hondureños. La mayoría son trabajadores de, de bajos salarios. Y pues sí, eh, ahorita estamos aquí en Imocal y en Florida, en Estados Unidos. Y es una comunidad básicamente de la mayoría de los trabajadores aquí son trabajadores, ¿verdad? Que trabajan en construcción, en agricultura. So, um, first of all, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, who we are as an organization. The CIW or the Coalition of Immokalee Workers is a human rights organization based in Immokalee, Florida. Um, we were created by, uh, by farm workers, uh, in and of itself. So we are an NGO. The vast majority of our staff uh, are former farm workers themselves and low-wage workers. Uh, the vast, our, our staff are largely from Guatemala and Mexico, Haiti, and Honduras. Um, and we are based right here in Immokalee, um, which is basically a town of low-wage workers who not only work in uh, agriculture, but also other industries like construction. Mm -hmm. Y bueno, como les digo, comenzamos en los años 90. Nuestra organización ya tiene más de 30, más de 30 años, 30 años de estar luchando para luchar, ¿verdad? Para mejorar las condiciones, para los abusos que existían en el trabajo agrícola aquí en la comunidad. Entre ellos había hace muchos años lo que era el acoso sexual, el robo de salario, la violencia de género. Eh, también eh, la esclavitud moderna en los campos aquí de la Florida, donde eh, la agricultura aquí es un negocio, ¿verdad?, de millones y millones de dólares al año. Más sin embargo, los trabajadores eran muchas de las veces no les pagaban, no recibían eh, ningún tipo de beneficio, no había ni agua ni baños, pero en cambio se sí había mucha violencia que estaba perjudicando a los trabajadores. Entonces nuestra visión o nuestro sueño era que los trabajadores se empoderaran, que los trabajadores tuvieran una voz y aprendieran, ¿verdad?, cómo defender sus derechos. So we began in the 1990s. So we've been around for over 30 years as an organization with always with the goal and the vision of creating better conditions, better wages for farm workers and addressing the abuses that we were seeing in the fields. For far too many years, workers faced um, issues like sexual harassment and assault, wage theft, uh, gender-based violence, and in extreme cases, modern-day slavery. 
we're talking about a massive industry, one that represents millions and millions of dollars uh, in commerce, and at the and yet the workers are barely paid and often are facing um, miserable conditions like having even you know there's no water, there's no bathroom, but there's plenty of um, of violence and abuse, and so our vision and our dream as an organization has always been for workers to have power, to have a voice in their place of work, um, and to be able to build a, a better industry. Para organizar en aquellos años con una, con una diferente variedad de diferentes costumbres, de diferentes idiomas, era un poco difícil para la coalición, por eso se usó, se usó desde el principio lo que era la educación popular. Mediante volantes, eh, dibujos, teatros, empezamos a organizar a los trabajadores. Ellos llegaban a las reuniones después de que llegaban de su trabajo. Se juntaban en una iglesia a escondidas de los patrones porque había un clima de miedo, un clima de intimidación que había en aquellos años. Y eso era lo que nosotros ¿verdad? queríamos parar, que el trabajador mismo supiera, ¿verdad?, que nuestro trabajo valía, que el trabajador mismo supiera de que uno tenía que, que luchar para que se le respetara y fuera visto como seres humanos. So, um, as a, you know, as an organization, in order to bridge the many different communities that made up this, uh, this, you know, our town of Immokalee and the many different customs, we used a strategy called popular education, I'm sure. Uh, many of you are familiar with. So we relied on um, flyers and, uh, and drawings and theater, things that you could connect with across language um, in order to invite and bring in uh, workers from the community. Um, and it's when we started, we were meeting in a back room of a church, you know, far from the eyes of our bosses because there was this atmosphere of intimidation Um, and that was what we wanted to change. We wanted to um, create uh, an environment in which we could fight for, um, for our rights and for a better environment. Desde los años 90 hasta el año 2000, el trabajo de la coalición fue organizar en nuestra comunidad, a nivel de la comunidad, hacer un llamado a lo que era los rancheros donde uno trabajaba aquí, aquí, en, aquí en Florida, donde estamos, existe lo que es el Comité de Tomate de la Florida, que básicamente lo componen los rancheros o las compañías más grandes de, de tomate de toda la Florida. Nosotros estábamos pidiendo a ellos un diálogo, que se sentaran con los trabajadores para trabajar juntos y parar con, ese, con esos abusos que pasaban. Que los rancheros se comprometieran también, ¿verdad?, a, a hacer algo para trabajar juntos y parar esa violencia. De los años 90 hasta el 2000, la coalición hizo diferentes marchas, protestas, huelgas de hambre para traer a la mesa del diálogo a los rancheros, que era significado pues todo lo, la industria no agrícola. Eh, no tuvimos esa oportunidad, por eso pensamos en escalar nuestra, nuestra campaña a un nivel más alto y fue cuando fuimos a lanzar lo que es la campaña por comida justa, básicamente traer el poder de las corporaciones en beneficio de los trabajadores. And so between 1990 and 2000, for the first decade of the organization, uh, we really focused on our own community with a call to action for the growers. So in where we are, there is the um, Florida, um, there is the Florida Tomato Growers Exchange and that represents basically the entire industry so we were asking for dialogue we we're asking for an end to these abuses um, and for a commitment from growers to actually um, help us in making that happen so we marched and we protested uh, and there were hunger strikes uh, in order to bring the florida tomato growers exchange to the table unfortunately we were not we we're never given that opportunity and so in 2001 um, we were able to launch the Campaign for Fair Food, which is a broader campaign in order to uh, actually go after the large corporations that purchase that food at the end of the day. Y porque entendimos, ¿verdad?, que los, los, uh, las corporaciones son los que tienen ese poder. El trabajador no sale de la labor si no se cumple una cierta cantidad de tomate que están demandando las corporaciones. 
los, los patrones siempre están presionando, porque ellos también los están presionando las corporaciones. Entonces hicimos ese análisis de que el tomate que uno piscaba no se quedaba con nosotros, sino que iba a las corporaciones. Entonces empezamos a buscar diferentes maneras de cómo traer ese, ese poder, la responsabilidad social para de las corporaciones hacia el trabajador, trabajar juntos para eh, mejorar ¿no? esa situación. Y fue ahí cuando también eh, convertimos a los consumidores, porque vimos que también el consumidor tenía un poder bien fuerte que da negocio a al, al, al la corporación. Entonces empezamos a concientizar al consumidor de que nos apoyara, de la lucha que teníamos los trabajadores y el por qué estábamos enfocando con marchas y protestas, así mucha, mucha presión pública con una, con una de las corporaciones de comida rápida que era Taco Bell. En aquellos años hicimos un boicot para poder traer a la mesa del diálogo y tener a los rancheros y a las corporaciones juntos y trabajar para usar, usar el poder corporativo en beneficio de los trabajadores. And so we did the analysis in that time that it was truly these corporations at the top of the supply chain that had an incredible amount of power because they were always pressuring um, the, the industry for a certain amount of tomatoes on a certain time frame for a certain price. Uh, and, you know, so it was really that realization and that light bulb of the, these tomatoes don't stay here. They don't stay here with us. Uh, and so we went, um, we went to those large companies at the top of the supply chain to call on them to act responsibly with regards to workers to actually work with us in order to use that power to improve the situation. Um, and it was at that point that we uh, built those connections with consumers because you realize that just everyday conscious consumers have um, have the power to work together with workers um, because they are the ones who choose whether or not to provide business to these large companies. And so we mounted um, marches and protests all across the country together uh, with consumers. Our first target was Taco Bell, one of the massive um, fast food companies in the United States. We launched a boycott in order to bring them to the table. Uh -huh. Fueron muchos años de lucha, fueron muchos años de estar eh, haciendo presión pública, fueron muchos años de crear alianzas con estudiantes, con gente de fe, con consumidores, pero la campaña con Taco Bell duró cuatro años. Pero para poder nosotros ver de qué manera Taco Bell podía ayudarnos, hicimos varias demandas a cada corporación. Cada corporación que llegara a la mesa del diálogo tenía que respetar las demandas que teníamos en beneficio de los trabajadores. La primera demanda era que cada corporación pagara un centavo más por cada libra de tomate y ese centavo iba a pasar directamente al cheque del trabajador y así vamos a mejorar los, los salarios. La segunda demanda era, era un código de conducta que era cero tolerancia para la esclavitud moderna y el acoso sexual en, en la industria, en los ranchos donde uno trabajaba. Y la tercera demanda era que el trabajador tuviera una voz dentro de cualquier acuerdo que hubiera entre la corporación y los rancheros. Iba a estar presente la voz del trabajador y así el trabajador iba a tener una voz dentro de cualquier eh, acuerdo que existiera. Entonces era tener, eh, estar trabajando juntos, ¿no? Era un acuerdo entre corporaciones, rancheros y trabajadores. And so uh, for me, there was many, many years of struggle, um, of campaigning and, you know, with building relationships with students, with people of faith, um, you know, for really for four, and we had that boycott going for four years before we won. Um, and the demands that we brought before every company was one, that they pay an extra premium on all of the produce that they buy that goes straight to workers uh, and their checks as a way to improve wages for workers. Two, that they uh, help to implement in their supply chain a code of conduct that includes zero tolerance for things like slavery and um, sexual violence. And finally, that workers themselves had, were a part of any agreement that was put into place, um, that we had a voice uh, in any contract that was put into place. And so it's really become a collaboration and a partnership between um, at every level of the supply chain of workers, buyers, and the growers. Mm -hmm. Esto era, eran campañas eh, nacionales que, que hicimos para presionar a las corporaciones y lo que queríamos eran a, acuerdos legales 
¿verdad? Para que así cuando hubiera algún abuso en los ranchos pasando y que los rancheros no, no quisieran ellos eh, arreglar ese problema, ahí iban a entrar las corporaciones pidiendo a los rancheros que si no se arreglaba ese problema, eh, ya las corporaciones no compraban su producto y así fue, ¿verdad? El poder de mercado que tenían para los rancheros fue que hizo que se encenderan la mesa del diálogo. Ahorita tenemos 14 corporaciones que están trabajando, ¿verdad? Para ayudar a derechos humanos a los trabajadores. Está Taco Bell, McDonald's, Subway, Burger King, tenemos a Sodexo, tenemos a Walmart, tenemos a Whole Foods, Trey Joe's. Son 14 corporaciones que hoy en día ya están trabajando en el programa que, por Comida Justa. Por un lado, seguíamos con la campaña, ¿verdad?, de, de Comida Justa. Y por el otro lado, seguíamos nosotros haciendo también presión con los rancheros. Cuando ya teníamos un número suficiente de, de, de corporaciones trabajando con nosotros, fue que también los rancheros vinieron a la mesa del diálogo. And so what we won through these campaigns were legally binding agreements between us as the CIW and these large buyers. And what they agreed to fundamentally was, for example, if there were one of those zero tolerance um, offenses or other, or they, they didn't implement the code of conduct in other ways that they'd be out of the program and they'd no longer be able to sell their produce to any of these massive corporations with whom we had these agreements. And today, after many years of struggle, we have these legally binding agreements with 14 of the world's largest corporations. We have um, Taco Bell, you know, McDonald's, Burger King, Whole Foods, Walmart, um, Sodexo and Aramark, Trader Joe's. Many companies um, now have these agreements with us that force them to cut purchases from farms that are not protecting the human rights of workers. And so what that um, ensuing program is, is called the Fair Food Program, because after we built enough power um, between everyday consumers and, and workers um, in the market, then that was able to finally bring growers to the table and actually create the Fair Food Program itself. Esto pasó en el 2011, cuando varios, varios compradores grandes de tomate eh, se estaban ya firmando los acuerdos. Y ahí en el 2011 fue cuando nació el nuevo día para los trabajadores, porque es cuando se hizo una realidad de que los trabajadores ya tuvieran una voz. Los trabajadores, eh, mediante estos acuerdos, se creó lo que es el programa de comida justa. Fue cuando empezamos a entrar a los ranchos, donde estaba el trabajador piscando, donde estaban los patrones, donde estaban los supervisores. Nosotros como trabajadores, hablando con los trabajadores de que conocieran sus derechos, cómo reportar abusos, las mujeres reportar acoso sexual, eh, parar lo que era la esclavitud en la labor, que conocieran ¿no? de qué se trataba el programa de comida justa y cuáles iban a ser los beneficios para los trabajadores. Hoy tenemos ese programa funcionando ya 11 años de estar entrando a la mayoría de los ranchos participantes en el programa de comida justa. El programa es ahorita uno de los programas reconocidos como uno de los mejores que ha parado la esclavitud moderna y, y el acoso sexual en la industria agrícola de la Florida. And so since 2011, um, we, we were able to create this program and that was really when a new day was born for workers you know, for the first time we felt that we had a real voice and a real um, source of power within our workplace through the Fair Food Program. That allowed us as the CIW to go on company property to do Know Your Rights education uh, with workers, with supervisors present, workers paid. Um, we So we do regular education on human rights, on the rights of um, women and uh, and men who work in the fields. Um, so that they understand what the benefits are that they're entitled to and, in, and work with us to enforce that. And so it's been a decade since we've been able to implement that, uh, that program, and it's been widely recognized both in the U.S. and internationally as one of the most promising models for um, human rights protection, um, and specifically in combating forced labor, modern-day slavery, and sexual violence. Y es algo que es muy rápido por el tiempo ¿verdad? que tenemos ahorita, pero en un principio, en un comienzo, eh, estábamos pensando que el programa pues solamente fuera para Florida y solamente en los tomates. Hoy en día el programa se ha expandido a, a siete estados 
desde aquí en los Estados Unidos y a otras industrias como la industria de, de, de la leche, la industria de la construcción, que han usado los trabajadores este modelo también para, lo adaptan ¿no? a las necesidades de cada trabajador para mejorar también sus condiciones de trabajo. Entonces, ahorita está todo muy bonito, pero tenemos todavía una campaña con otra corporación que es Wendy's, que Wendy's no es un comprador de tomate. Tenemos un boicot nacional ya ocho años, porque Wendy's no ha querido sentarse a la mesa del diálogo, aunque hemos hecho muchos llamados y conocen el programa, pero no ha hecho nada, ¿verdad?, para usar este programa en beneficio de sus trabajadores, aunque tiene un montón de problemas de acoso sexual, de robo de salario. Lo único que ha hecho es que cambió su compra de México a invernaderos. Supuestamente con eso ya estaba solucionado el problema que existía de derechos humanos para los trabajadores. Mar uh, Nelly, this is Susan and Marley. If you could, we're at the one minute mark for uh, your presentation. Perfect. Yep. Go ahead. Entonces, demos un, un minuto más. Um, so, Uh, you know, and this is obviously a lot of information for a, a very brief presentation, but although we started, the last thing we'll say is that um, although we started in tomatoes in Florida, the program has grown and expanded and has shown itself to be adaptable and scalable. We are now in seven states across uh, the United States and also workers from a number of other industries have taken this as a model, as a blueprint. Um, and have replicated this in their industries, whether that's in the dairy industry or the construction industry. Um, and so we've been able to, uh, again, mentor other worker organizations and bringing this model to their industries. Um, and that is all incredibly exciting. And at the same time, we know we have to keep fighting. And so we, have, we continue to have corporate campaigns to bring more companies into the fold of the fair food program. So we currently have a Um, a national boycott with Wendy's, uh, which has uh, failed to join the fair food program. We've been um, pushing them for eight years. They're the only major fast food company that has refused to join the program in spite of the fact that it's been proven to combat sexual harassment, wage theft, and many of the other issues that we've mentioned. Um, they have turned their backs on this program again and again. And so we do call on everyone to boycott Wendy's uh, and to be a part of this ongoing campaign to expand the program. Y bueno, yo sé que el tiempo se terminó. Pues muchísimas gracias a todos y vamos a estar aquí para preguntas. And so, um, you know, we know that the time is short and so we just want to say thank you to everyone and we'll be around for questions. Muchas gracias. There's also a petition that could be signed in the chat. So our next speaker is J.D. Hadakar. He's our, he's a journalist, a writer, a researcher, from Nagpur, India. He's a roving reporter with the People's Archive of Rural India, a fellow of the New Indian Foundation, an author, Ram Roy, and a village awaits doomsday. Morning from India. I wish all of you a very happy Diwali. Today is the day of Festival of Lights in India. I extend my greetings and wishes to all of you. Uh, just a small disclaimer, unlike my previous esteemed speakers, uh, I'm, not into the, I'm not into the practitioner mode, but I am an avid and very staunch supporter of all the democratic and nonviolent struggles across the world. India, as you know, is a vastly agriculture country with more than 50 agroecological -ecolo zones. Um, and about 70% of Indians still depend directly and indirectly uh, on agriculture on, and agrarian systems. Uh, nearly 80 to 90, now almost inching towards 90% of Indian farmers are small and extremely marginal with less than one hectare of land only. Um, that is a structural problem because It doesn't support the economic well being of the people in the current uh, form of economy. Uh, these many farmers hold 49 to 50% of land. So you can see the land inequality, the top 10% hold about 50% of land, farm lands, and the bottom 90% hold the remaining 49% of, of land. Uh, the another structural problem 
is that 70% of Indian farming is rain dependent. And rain dependent means that you have limited crop choices. You have income coming once or twice. It's really a sustain, sustainable kind of livelihood system. Uh, and allied sector, whether it is dairy, poultry, poultry, all that is limited. In the last 30 years of neoliberal economic policies, India has transitioned away from agrarian economy to a more service economy. Service sector now sustains, brings about 67% of GDP. When India became independent in 1947, agriculture GDP was around 70%, which has now declined to less than 15%, which means that a huge sections of Indian masses who are engaged in agriculture, their incomes are really falling and that really is the crux of the whole crisis, which leads to economic problems. Among them, the vicious debt cycle, which never goes away. Farmers are indebted to a level that leads many of them to commit to take their own lives. Between 1996 and 2019, about 400,000 Indian farmers have killed themselves by mode of suicide. And hundreds of them migrate in distress to, 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 the, to, the, to the urban areas for work. A, a month ago, a report came from the National Statistical Survey Organization, which indicates that the real incomes from land are now less than the income from wages, which tells you that land has become unremunerative. And therefore, P. Sainath, my editor at Pari and my mentor, calls it a full-blown civilizational crisis. This transition from agriculture to services is just one symptom or one indicator of that. Or access to credit, lack of access to credit, high commercial inputs, all these are just the sort of underlying conditions that aggravate this crisis. The other faction or other side of this whole thing, the economic uh, volcano that I call, is the ecological disaster that we sit on. India's groundwater is highly ex exploited, both by the industry and by the commercial use. Um, the perennial Indian rivers, which are the life systems of hundreds of thousands of people, fishermen, and you know, the ecological systems that depend on that are in great trouble. Most of them are no more perennial rivers. They have turned into seasonal rivers, leading into frequent droughts, not famines yet, because we have overcome the food deficit through our public distribution systems, but rivers are in big crisis. And it is irony that people living in the river basins who were part of the civilizational growth are now migrating away from rivers into cities for work as well as water. Loss of biodiversity is another issue that I think is aggravating the crisis because as West rightly said, that we have moved far, far away from the perennial you know, biodiverse systems of agroecology into more annualized commercial cropping systems. Monocropping, which is a big, big problem, when I say monocropping, most of the Indian farming is now cotton, wheat, and paddy. These three crops now occupy more than 50% of Indian land spaces. We have seen a massive and sharp drop in perennial trees, whether it is horticulture or any other you know, biodiverse thing. In the climatic era, we are seeing frequency of droughts and frequency of floods going really up. And it has been proven and sort of systematically, meticulously researched and reported by many scientists and journalists as well across the country. We have also got another ecological disaster, which is a growing man-animal conflict. Animals, wild animals are now turning into massive pests leading to crop losses that are incomprehensible. Uh, but overarching, like other speakers said, the context of this whole crisis, whether these are farm suicides or migrations in distress or you know, undernutrition, is growing inequality in a heavily commercialized age. 
everything has been commercialized and privatized. Education, health costs. I've seen in COVID times how people in rural India suffered from lack of oxygen and died in the absence of medical care. They didn't die, they didn't die of coronavirus per se, they died for the lack of health care because the commercialization of healthcare has seen a massive shift towards privatization of our healthcare. And I think the agrarian crisis in India is not just limited to agriculture per se, it is a full-blown socio-economic, cultural and political crisis. It is also the crisis of other sectors, including the services which are heavily epicentered around the urban areas. Um, Education, the quality of education, both the agriculture education as well as formal other education is, is completely in support of skills rather than values or agroecological sustainable practices. Um, overall, therefore, the social structures in India, particularly in rural India are crumbling. You see the growth of um, identity politics as the resource crunch affects the people more and more. And therefore, um, it is leading to a full-blown civilizational crisis. The, the, the crisis is no more limited to the countryside. It is not going to affect even the urban India. As we speak, the prices of fuel, diesel, petrol, edible oil, pulses are probably in the, on the, at the historic high, which has affected the working masses, even in the urban areas. You know, I was reminded while, while you know, my African friend was speaking uh, through his video, I was reminded that Marx said that, you know, accumulation uh, comes through the exploitation of labor. I go further to remind my other audiences that it also comes from the exploitation of raw material as Rosa Luxemburg, one, Luxemburg once said, and as Michael Levin is, is sort of telling us that accumulation through disposition is the biggest process happening in our times, leading at least in India and probably the world over where family farms are in deep trouble as the big sharks enter into the agriculture and food, scapes, uh, food landscape. Bilateral and multilateral agreements are ripping apart the, the farm economies all over the world. Um, in such a situation, what can we do? I'll just wrap up. What can we do and what needs to be done? I think we need to, apart from our struggles and you know, addressing of the policy systems, we also got to look at the constructive programs to build them into our struggles. As Gandhi would demonstrate, Bapu would demonstrate that agroecology and collectives, the small within the big framework, is working in many areas across the world, whether it is Masipag in Philippines or the Kudumbashri model in South of India. Uh, we might do well to build our constructive programs that are working into, into our agroecological systems to rally and demonstrate that things work when the, when the things come from the bottom, not the top down. Um, I think I'll stop here. I, Profusely thank the Green Party for having me um, on, and on this esteemed panel. I've been you know, greatly inspired by Wes Jackson's work at the land. And now, of course, Nelly's work and my African friend's work there. Thank you very much. Thank you, JD. We're going to start with comments. And I was going to hope to get Elizabeth Fatad of the Green Social Thought first uh, before you have to leave at the top of the hour, Elizabeth. Would you like to make a comment? How is that? Can you hear me? No. Mm -hmm. No, yes, I can hear you. Go ahead, please. Now you can hear me. OK. Well, I live in San Diego, California. So it's really interesting, um, a certain name, what uh, Nancy Rodriguez was saying, because the uh, same problems we have here. I, I learned some interesting facts. Um, well, first of all, I want to begin about California and like India, we're in a drought. 
And so actually some farms here have um, stopped producing. They, they let their field go fallow because they didn't have water. And also water here is very expensive. So for a farmer, you have to you know, rely on if, you know, having a crop and paying this much for water, it's not worth it. The other interesting thing that I learned was that there are a lot of farms in Mexico. As you understand, San Diego is right next to Mexico and people say by locally, actually I'm closer to Mexico than I am to Northern California, uh, but that's another issue. What I mean is, and I was shocked, I, I realized that there were uh, American farmers in, um, in uh, Mexico, but I didn't realize how many, and these are American companies actually in Mexico, and they have about 45,000 acres, and that's 18,000 hectares actually, and they employ 11,000 people. And of course, the same thing, farm workers, uh, here, getting back to uh, San Diego, we actually have still some, some family farms. And I mean, I, we have to make a distinction because they talk about corporate farms. Now, there's a lot of farms here that it's owned by the family. They make about a billion dollars on their farm products and they are corporate. So it's not exactly the same as you think of a corporation like Monsanto or something. These are farmers that have incorporated. And this is true of a lot of farms in California. However, in San Diego, what they have done is they have, uh, I, I don't know if it's on the books, but that's a law that you cannot sell land that, is, that has been farmland. In fact, the developers are, are really anxious to get this farmland, but they now it is very difficult for, for for developers to get this farmland. And there are still um, there are still family farms, and I mean real family farms, not corporate family farms. It makes a huge difference. And one more thing I want to point out: it's it's such an irony here on the border with Mexico, where they make this big deal. Of course, you know of of, of migrants coming in. Actually, if California did not have these migrants on the farms, they would not exist. So the irony is <laughs> almost too much. Anyway, that's all I will say about California. Elizabeth, thank you so much. I want to let Don speak next. Don Fitz. Okay, I I'm unmuted. I wanted to tell everybody that we're gonna have the same uh, sort of program on December the 1st, the first Wednesday uh, of, of December. Uh, the program is gonna be titled Healing a Broken Agricultural System. We'll start off with John Eichert talking about the myths of industrial agriculture. And one of the myths that John will be talking about is the myth that you can't do anything with the agricultural system. Next, we'll have Ali Fisher talking about agricultural poisons and pesticides including how we can farm without them. And third, we'll have Superba uh, Sishan from India, who will be talking about biodiversity uh, and ongoing problems of agriculture. And the last speaker will be Mitchell Pearson, who will talk about urban farming and the decolonization of farm practices in St. Louis, which will be in line with what Asa Anpur said about South Africa. Our moderator, we're very lucky we have, uh, oh, Joe, if you can share, screen share with me. Uh, I wanted to show this. Um, we, we will have Stan Cox, who will be the, um, the moderator, and he will be commenting on the use of uh, grains for feeding animals and biofuels and how much land is required, uh, required for that. Let's see if, I can, if we can get a share screen. Barbara's seen if we can share screen from our end. Um, so, so um, we all see it. Uh, what's that? We all see you. Oh, you do see it? Okay, it's just that I don't see it because I'm uh, talking. Okay, so and Stan just came out with this book yesterday, um, uh, the, the a Path to a Livable Future. So be sure to tune in on December the 1st, if at all possible. Thanks, Don. I'm going to move to the comments alphabetically. The uh, co sponsoring organization Attack the System. Keith Preston. 
Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, uh, as was said, I am the managing editor of uh, a website called attackthesystem.com, and I'm also the director of the Attack the System organization. Uh, I just wanted to point out that agriculture is not only a weapon of domination, it is the ultimate weapon of domination. Um, I was glad to hear earlier uh, Professor Jackson uh, point to the work of Professor James Scott, who uh, Professor Scott's work in anthropology uh, really does uh, demonstrate how agricultural dominance was fundamental to the origins of the state, to the origins of class domination and patriarchy in antiquity uh, as the first civilizations were being formed. Uh, and also modern civilization is the product of the expropriation of native and indigenous people everywhere on every continent. Uh, so the struggle uh, for land rights uh, that we see going on in, in many different parts of the world today is really the, the fundamental of the struggle, a fundamental basis for the struggle for all rights. Uh, and the fight for the environment is a, a natural corollary for the fight uh, for freedom for all peoples everywhere uh, against capitalism and against imperialism, against racism, patriarchy and authoritarianism. Uh, so that's really all I have to say. And uh, thank you for the, for the speakers for your presentations. Thanks so much, Keith. I'm gonna, I've got some more comments, uh, but I wanna have questions for the speakers. Do we have any questions for uh, JD, uh, Wes, Nelly? or um, Dr. Fields. Okay. I see Chris, Chris Mann, you have your hand up? Yes. Actually, I have uh, one yeah. in the chat. Yeah, I have a question um, uh, uh, for Ms. Rodriguez and also, um, uh, the speaker from India, um, what do you think of the hundreds of workers that are now, actually it's thousands of workers that are on strike in the United States, and have have you ever, Immokalee workers ever wanted to link up or have conversations with the fast food workers? Um, and then is, is this, the resistance in India, which has mostly gone unnoticed uh, in the United States in terms of the media, could that be considered a general strike in the whole country? The, re the resistance by the farmers. Should I go first, Susan? Yes, please, Jake. Yeah, I think the the farmers' protests that have now entered into the second year, they, they've just done an anniversary, have generally been uh, neglected or ignored within the capitalist you know, media systems. But uh, I, I can't say that it's a general strike, but it is one of the biggest protests in the modern post-neoliberal uh, history of this country. And it is basically, as farmers see, it's basically a, a struggle for survival of the systems that support them. Whatever little support existed, exists, I think the government in India is wanting to dismantle uh, that support system. Um, and there is a considerable solidarity across the, across the country, now increasingly also among the working classes, because uh, while farmers are on the streets, what has also gone unnoticed is uh, our disastrous labor laws that were passed without consensus, without the by bulldozing the parliamentary process last uh, winter uh, or last monsoon when the first wave um, of COVID had struck India. So I think increasingly you will see uh, even the even the daily wagers or the unorganized sector joining these farm struggles as things open up and things ease up on the COVID front. Yes. Thank you, JD. Ms. Nelly, would you like to answer that question from Chris Mann? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Cris, ahorita sobre si hemos estado apoyando a los trabajadores de comida rápida que están ahorita en, en huelga. 
no tenemos ahorita nosotros el conocimiento porque de que estén, ¿verdad?, en, en huelga los trabajadores. Durante ese tiempo de pandemia, ya desde 2020, 2019, 20, 21, cada, ya dos años, eh, la organización pues no ha estado ahorita saliendo ni haciendo protestas, pero este, para, lo del, para la, la lucha por 15 sí tenemos, hemos estado apoyándolos, hemos estado siempre trabajando juntos, ellos han venido a nuestras acciones y nosotros hemos, hemos apoyado también a ellos en su lucha durante varios años ya, ahorita pues ya han estado, ya han visto verdad un poco más de, de, de victoria con ahorita lo que ya, se, ya está por pasar que han aumentado el salario a 15 dólares, entonces sí hemos estado ahorita apoyándolos a, a los que tienen su lucha So, um, so Chris, you know, thank you for your question. Um, you know, and certainly, you know, we're not specifically aware. I don't know if you're talking about the the fight for 15 folks or um, or others, um, but you know, we really have been in in pretty much in lockdown because of COVID. <laughs> so we haven't been doing a lot of in person actions um, in recent years. Uh, in such as such as that one specifically, but we've had um, a really good relationship with and, and had a lot of cross movement solidarity with groups like Fight for 15. They've come to our actions, we've come to their actions. Um, we actually had a big victory here in Florida uh, during the 2020 election and in, in getting the, um, thanks to their leadership and getting the whole state's um, minimum wage raised to $15 an hour um, over the course of the next several years. So it is some that kind of um, collaboration and, and mutual support is something that we always strive for. Thank you. Dr. Fields, would you like to answer the question? Dr. Aisha Fields, you might have yes. to mute. Good. Thank Can you, you hear me? Yes. yes, I'm sorry, I missed part of the question. I wasn't completely clear on what the question was. Chris, can you want to repeat your question? I, I just wanted um, speakers to comment on the striketober situation that we have in the United States that um, is, is that, can we look forward to more workers um, getting into uh, resisting conditions of employment or um, what, just what do you think about it? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think um, the work that we're involved in, uh, specifically as APDEP, which is the organization that ASA uh, was representing as a aspect of the work of the overall Uhura movement, in terms of our APDEP work, we um, are not involved directly in that kind of work, um, but I'd be happy you know, to, to talk a little bit more about the kind of work that we're doing specifically around building dual power programs for, for African people. But thank you for, you know, for the opportunity to weigh in. Thank you, Dr. Fields. Dr. West, West Jackson, do you wanna comment on Chris Mann's question regarding striketober and worker action. Okay. What, what, what? Striketober, the workers going on strike. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, what we know is that um, fundamental change tends to come from the streets or when there is. A, an extensive protest that um, lasts. We see that right now with the Black Lives Matter and so forth. Uh, it seems as though government, governor, governments have something of a deaf ear to what's going on on the ground. Um, I mean, this is just sort of a simple reality that we notice about uh, about humanity, especially in um, industrialized societies. So I don't know what there is to say other than uh, uh, there has to be <clears throat> the people 
uh, from the bottom up that are going to <clears throat> make the necessary changes. Uh, <clears throat> one thing I didn't say, I was waiting uh, partly till the end. You know, we uh, at the Land Institute set out to deal with the problem of agriculture and uh, uh, do something about plant breeding. Uh, Stan Cox is one of our plant breeders to make perennial grain crops so we wouldn't be tearing the ground up every year. Well, when we started the land grant universities, they were not interested in what we were doing or they may have found it interesting, but they were not ready to act on it. So what did it take? It took people supporting a nonprofit organization and those people uh, keep putting in money. It's many at considerable sacrifice to themselves. And so it did not arise within government. It arose from the people, from the ground up. And, um, that has worked pretty well for us. We have, you know, the first perennial grain uh, in the history of the U.S. of the country of the world, really, and it's spreading some, but it did not uh, get its initiative um, until, um, you know, there was a long enough acknowledgement. People knew that there were uh, there were problems with agriculture. Uh, but I think it took, took the people. So I think that's generally our message for what's to come. Uh, I don't think we should expect, uh, yeah, well, we expect, but we also need to see to it that it, it happens. And that comes, that comes from, uh, well, the streets from, opposition to, well, just fundamental protest. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Um, Angie, you had some questions in the chat. I think you had some questions for Dr. Fields. Angelica. Uh, yeah, could you please read it from the chat because I don't have it in front of me. <laughs> I would appreciate that. I'm gonna look for that and I'm gonna let, uh, I'm gonna ask Frank Lawrence of the Green Party of Kansas City to comment while I look for Angelica's um, chat. Guesting, uh, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yes. I am Frank Lawrence and I represent the Green Party of Kansas City and Missouri. I wanted to, to add a few things that kind of go along with your narratives. I love the title, The Old Future is Gone because I honestly believe that our status quo is pretty much dead, the governments will not save us. And my family genealogy studies have revealed that most of my ancestors were Irish. And those people came to the United States as a response to the potato famine, they were starving to death. There was plenty of food in Ireland to feed them, but they made a political choice to sell all of the rest of it off as cash crops and let the others starve. So, so uh, my idea of focuses around the idea of creating like a Wikipedia where a bunch of, it'll be like an editorial board where we share ideas with each other online and move, move a little faster than publishing books. And that, and that we, uh, it's fully, fully cross-referenced with pictures and videos and instruction manuals of how the average person can do something to save their planet. And I'll, I'll offer you an example, maybe not the best example, but one that I thought of uh, off the top of my head, was that in the United States of America, our standard of beauty, which affects regulations on a local level, of course, is that every household should be surrounded by a little mini golf course of a lawn. And this, this monoculture of grass has to be constantly reseeded and fertilized and it has to be treated with herbicides and insecticides. And, and then it has to be mowed constantly and uh, you have to do something with the grass collecting. So it, it never ends. So, so that what we replace our monoculture lawns with perennial gardens that bloom from spring to fall and that they provide water, food and shelter for insects 
such as bees and butterflies and birds, which doesn't sound like, oh, well, that's going to save the planet. But if we can't save those creatures, we cannot save ourselves. So we've got to move away from models that represent bad agriculture, bad, bad living in general. And so I would offer that as an example of, of what one of the things that we might do to, to help save the planet. And in our Wikipedia-like structure, people would interject these ideas that would make things that the average person can do that they've got control of. We can plant a trillion trees. The government probably won't do this for you. And we can increase our wetlands to help absorb more of the rains that come down and save our, our drinking water and change. change. The, the human beings need to live in a forest and we need to live in the healthy grasslands and wetland areas. And uh, we need to get away from the current models that provide food deserts for other organisms that we have to live with on this planet. So those are just a few of the comments. Thank you, Mr. Warren. I found, I had a chance, whoever's got me on, yeah, mute. I found uh, Angie's uh, comments to Dr. Fields. Dr. Fields, please explain to us the strategy of dual and contending power. Dual and contending power as it relates to the agricultural projects on the ground that comrade um, Asa mentioned. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. I really appreciate it. And um, just to say, uh, first of all, that at the organization that I'm responsible for leading is an organization that was established by the African People's Socialist Party, uh, which is uh, led by Chairman Omalia Shatella. Um, and the theory that our party, AFDEP, is guided by is called African internationalism. And it recognizes that the primary contradiction that all human beings are confronted with is uh, colonial capitalism. That uh, we live in a world where uh, the vast majority of the world's people uh, are colonized people. They have no, we have no control, uh, no power over our land, over our labor, over our resources. And um, this colonial capitalist system benefits uh, uh, the white ruling class and the white general white population um, at the expense of you know, the rest of humanity. And we recognize in the African People's Socialist Party, and APDEP is our, um, is our development arm, for lack of a better word. We build what our uh, party calls dual power development programs which are programs that help our people to feed, clothe, and house ourselves. They're programs that recognize that um, as colonized people, it is our responsibility to once again um, become uh, our own, uh, our own uh, government, that we have to create the capacity to govern ourselves. And so when we talk about dual and contending power, we're talking about developing the capacity the African working class for the vast majority of African workers, African toilers who uh, have their own people's power that negates the role that the colonial state plays in our lives. Uh, because we don't intend just survive. Uh, we can't live, we can't uh, uh, you know, see a future for ourselves or for our children with uh, this current social system intact, it's not possible. So dual and contending power is not about building programs that help us to survive, but that help us to, uh, it, to engage in a struggle uh, with imperialism to uh, defeat it. Um, and for the African working class to emerge uh, as, as, as our own uh, liberators. So that's what we do when we build our own community gardens and our farms and our healthcare programs is absolutely the part of that process and to negate the role that, that the colonial state plays in our lives as African people. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Fields. Um, Nellie and Marley will be leaving in about eight minutes. Do we have any questions specifically for Nellie Rodriguez and um, anything specific for her at this point? Then I'll continue with the comments. Uh, the next commenter is going to be uh, Barb of the Green Party of St. Louis. I got it muted. Yeah. 
I'll time my, I'm the timer and I'm going to time myself here. Uh, greetings from the St. Louis Green Party. Uh, a little bit of history, back in the 1980s, the St. Louis Greens became heavily involved in the issues of GMOs and pesticides. And for many years, we organized conferences and many of the marches against Monsanto's as St. Louis was the world headquarters for Monsanto. In the early years, I began connecting the dots between GMOs, pesticides, soil degradation, water pollution, heavily processed foods, treatment of farm workers and health issues. Then later came the concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs. Before World War II, Missouri was considered the part of the United States referred to as our breadbasket. Missouri produced tomatoes, green beans, melons, and short produce was shipped all over the country from our state. Now our fields are filled, filled with monocultures of corn and soy, soy that is primarily used to feed CAFO animals and produce processed foods. Corn also used for CAFO feed and for ethanol or fuel. And this is how Monsanto now Bayer describes what they do as feeding the world. I'm now gaining a better understanding of how colonialism has in the past and continues to play a large part in agriculture in the US and internationally. It is notable that the early years of colonialism also focused on monocultures of sugar, coffee, cotton, and tobacco used not to feed people, but as a form of currency fueled by slave labor. That system planted the deep roots of racism that continues to haunt our country today. The good news is that we are not just singing to the choir anymore as it is my belief that these revelations are slowly seeping into the broader cultural consciousness. There are alternatives to the broken and unsustainable system of industrial agriculture. And the other piece of good news is that we're gonna be addressing that in the December webinar, Healing a Broken Agricultural System. And thank you for taking my comments. Thank you, Barb. Uh, Marley and Mary? Yes. So first, just want to say thank you to everyone. And I know Nelly is also going to hop in when she hops off mute, but we really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be in conversation with you all and the incredible work um, of all of our, um, all of the other panelists. No sé, Nelly, si quieres decir algunas palabras. Pues sí, es lo mismo, ¿no? Agradecer a todos por su participación y eh, pues apoyar, ¿no? En la lucha, estamos aquí para apoyar en lo que se pueda. Eh, nos gustaría mucho pues seguir, ¿no? En comunicación, en contacto con todos los grupos porque eso es el que, eso es el que hace el cambio, ¿no? Unirnos porque todos tenemos un mismo fin, ¿no? Que se nos escuche y que se nos tome en cuenta. Uh, por ahorita nos vamos. No, mañana tenemos que salir a las 5 de la mañana precisamente a un rancho a hablar, a hacer la educación de trabajador a trabajador sobre los derechos. Así de que muchísimas gracias a todos. Fue un gusto y un placer compartir con ustedes. So thank you everyone. Thank you very much for your time um, and for uh, the opportunity to have this connection. We want to say, you know, um, also that we're here to support uh, in all of these different struggles and all of this different type of work. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, you know, tomorrow we have to get up at 5 a.m. to <laughs> um, head out to the fields to actually do some Know Your Rights education. So um, thanks for understanding. Um, so we'll go ahead and hop off. But again, thanks thanks to everyone and feel free to reach out. I'll, um, I'll put my email in the chat for anybody who would like to follow up. Gracias. Thank you. Yes, the luego. Bye. Goodbye and good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. The next comment from the Green Party of Washington State, Jody Grage. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, I'm Jody Grage. I'm with the Green Party of Washington State. We are pleased to be one of the sponsors of this event. Um, I'm an elder, I'm 85. And I look back uh, a ways, and it seems to me that part of part of the discussion here is that big business and governments have really 
encouraged us to have what are considered to be modern needs. Um, and this is spread around the world. And one of the things that happens when you are encouraged to uh, become a, an, a consumer and have your rights as a modern person wherever you live is that subsistence um, ceases to exist or at least it weakens over time. Um, subsistence, having your own vegetable garden and being able to support yourself is wonderfully freeing and empowering. And that's the last thing that, that got most governments and big business want for us. So there is a cultural shift that occurs where the way your, your people have always done thing done things is no longer okay. It's rather primitive. Um, and certainly you deserve better than that. But what happens when you lose the ability to, to sustain yourself is that you put your well-being in other people's hands, which is generally not a terribly great idea. Um, and the other and and you get to the place where the 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 product that has the lowest price is the one you get which doesn't uh account for adequately paying workers or quality of life um waste goes up nutrition goes down and so i would encourage us all to think about um the whole idea of sustenance sustainability being able to sustain yourself um, because that is a very powerful position. Being able to grow your own food, repair things, make do with what you've got um, is, is very powerful. I figured out when I was 10 that you, could, that you could substitute for money, but not for time. And that the more money you needed, the more other people could tell you what to do. Um, so I can still repair a lot of stuff. I've done a lot of stuff. I grow a lot of food and I really don't need all that stuff that they're trying to sell me to get my money. So I'll be in debt and have to do things I don't want to. So I, I think we need to look at that larger picture of sustenance, um, subsistence, uh, living, and sustainability because it fits into agriculture and a lot of other things. And thank, thank you. you very much for having this program. Thank you, Jody. Illinois Green Party, Anna, your comments? Hi, I'm here. Um, thank you so much for um, hosting another uh, great webinar. I'm just so proud to be a green and um, to be talking about this. Um, other parties are not talking about this. Um, so, and, and it makes me feel proud that to know that there's actually the program that's going on where the workers can have uh, a decent wage. I've been boycotting Taco Bell and Walmart and McDonald's for over 20 years. and. My 10 year old has only eaten McDonald's for it three times his whole life. He reminds me all the time. Um, so it makes me very thankful to know that we're still part of a team and that we are actually making some kind of progress in regards to workers' rights in those areas. Um, and I like Frank Lawrence's idea of like a Wikipedia page. Um, we do have, I know the Greens have that 101 uh, things you can do list, which is nice, but I think a Wikipedia can help grow and build more. Um, and I always welcome people to come on um, Base Camp. Um, I'm sure you've heard of it if you're in the National Party, that uh, there's a Base Camp that is a project management software, so we can organize on that software. Um, I'll put my information in chat. It's just volunteer at ilgp.org. That's volunteer at ilgp.org. And then we can take it from here. 
and we can organize more um, off um, online after the webinar. Thank you very much. The next, I've got a question uh, in the chat and then I'll go to the next. Uh, I was with, uh, this is from Digger to everyone. I was with uh, Aisha on, was still on the webinar. I would like to hear how Africans feel about Bill Gates' intrusion into their agriculture. Um, Gates is hailed as a hero in the mainstream media, but, is, but isn't he pushing high-tech solutions like GMOs to enrich non-African investors to make Europeans continue to dominate African agriculture? Dr. Fields, any comments? Yes, thanks for that question, Daniel. Um, I think that uh, what you're raising about Bill Gates is, is fair, is correct. Um, I would take it a step further and say that it's, it's bigger than Bill Gates. Right now, African people, no matter where we are, we can talk specifically on the continent of, right, of Africa right now, since you, know, you raised the question of this intrusion in Africa. Um, African people uh, do not have control over our resources in Africa, despite the fact that you see uh, African governments, what you're really looking at uh, is neo-colonialism, looking at governments that are in place not to serve the needs or the interests, or the aspirations of African people, to serve the needs and the interests of, of, of Europe, the United States, increasingly uh, of China and other uh, forces uh, in the world. And so we're not looking at anywhere on the continent of Africa, the African people's interests being met as it relates to agriculture or anything else. Uh, prior to Europe's attack on Africa, African people didn't have these questions of not being able to feed our people. We didn't have, um, you know, even, the, you know, these issues that now Gates and others purport to be attempting to solve. Um, and African people, in order to resolve this contradiction, have to be able to have control over our own land. We have to have a government, a united socialist Africa that unites all of the people, all of the resources of Africa that will meet the needs of African people. There's no reason why any African on the continent of Africa or any place around the world should ever go hungry because Africa is the wealthiest continent on earth. And the land itself is, is fully capable of sustaining uh, African people. So the question for us is greater than this Bill Gates. It's a question of African people having control over our own land and having the ability to determine what will be grown, how it would be grown uh, you know, now and into the future. So I appreciate you, Daniel, for that question and for giving us an opportunity to deepen that issue of African people needing control over our own resources and land. Thank you, Dr. Fields. I'm going on to the next commentator, Lynn Stewart Organization, comment by Ralph Pointer. Ralph Pointer. Ralph Pointer, the Lynn Stewart Organization. I'll come back to you. Missouri Green Party, comment by Tamala Turner. Um, hi, uh, everyone. Uh, the Missouri Green Party stands in solidarity with organizations, agencies, institutions, and activist groups that fight against food deserts and under-resourced communities of color. We stand for the basic human right of access to quality, healthy, nutritious food for all people so that all people have the opportunity to thrive and reach their full potential free of chronic health conditions and premature deaths. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Ms. Turner. The next speaker is going to be um, Joan. Joan, are you prepared to speak? And could you mention the name of your Green Party, please? I'm, okay, I'm just trying to unmute myself and put this camera on. Yeah, hi, I'm Joe McKernan from the Broom Tioga Green Party, which is in New York State, uh, central New York State, where I am surrounded by farmlands where people are still uh, trying to maintain small family farms 
against the incursion of, of course, the corporate uh, global farm uh, uh, systems. Uh, previously, when I lived in Ireland for many years, I uh, was uh, um, I worked with the Rural Agricultural Program, which was supporting farmers in the west coast of Ireland against the intrusion of the European Union. The European Union uh, had an organized uh, process of turning all farms into corporate farmland. And we were trying to find ways to sustain local farming and do training and stuff for the, for the farmers there. So what I, I, I thank all the speakers and what it brings to mind and, and what, what you're all doing and what I have seen happening is what you're fighting for workers control of your workplace, of your land, of, of our, you know, of our farming, uh, of the production of the food that we need. And we very, we, we focus on the work as socialists, which I am, we focus on the working class and very little work is done with the agricultural workers of the world. So thank you for giving it this attention and, and focusing on what I see the very valuable fight backs that you you are, are involved in in each of the areas. And thank you to the comrade from India who brings us back to Marx and Luxembourg and the lessons that they learned so long ago and shared with the world. Uh, what we need to do, the enemy that our joint enemy, whether we are black, white, brown, or whatever color, or whatever continent we are on, when people are working and are fighting to control their lives, they're, they're, be, they're, they're fighting against the system. And the system they're fighting against is capitalism, which controls all of us. And without defeating that system of capitalism, we're not gonna have individual sustainable farming. We're not gonna have a planet the way things are going. There won't be anything left for anybody. And we need to defeat that system. And the only people who are gonna be able to do it is the organized working class. Farmers, industrial, service workers of every color, creed, and country. So workers of the world, you're starting to unite with little webinars like this. Congratulations. And we need to pick up the struggle and focus on supporting all of this work. Thank you. Thank you. I'm asking Jesse Neville of the Yahoo Solidarity Movement to comment next, please. Thank you. Uhuru. Sorry. Okay. Uh, thank you so much to the Green Party and the Universal African People's Organization and all the co-sponsors of this event. My name is Jesse Neville and I'm representing the Uhuru Solidarity Movement, the organization of white people formed by and working under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, organizing in the white community for reparations to African people, and solidarity with African, Mexican, indigenous, and colonized peoples fighting for self-determination and national liberation. And I wanna salute the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party, including its founder and chairman, Omali Shatella, and deputy chair, Onizene Shatella, as well as the brilliant presentation and analysis of Asa Anpu of the African People's Socialist Party of Occupied Azania and Dr. Aisha Fields, also an APSP leader and director of the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project, as well as my leadership in the Solidarity Committee, African People's Solidarity Committee Chairwoman Penny Hess. From USM, I wanna express our profound unity with the African internationalist understandings put forward by Asa Anpu based on the understandings of Chairman Omalia Shatella that the question of the environment, of resolving the climate crisis, of sustainable agriculture, cannot be separated from the essential and fundamental struggle in the world today, the struggle by African and colonized workers to liberate themselves, their lands, labor, and resources from the blood-sucking colonial capitalist system that was built on their backs for the benefit of the white colonizer population. As has been stated by, uh, by Asa Ampu and by Dr. Aisha Fields, and as Chairman Omali Shatella has brilliantly exposed, colonialism is responsible for the decimation of the earth not racism, the ideas in the minds of white people, but the mode of production called colonialism, defined by the foreign and hostile domination of whole peoples and nations by a colonial state for the economic and political benefit of the white colonizer population. 
Prior to the invasion of Africa and the so-called Americas by white settlers, the world's peoples lived in a harmonious relationship to the land and saw the land, the people, and the rest of nature as one. It was Europe, white people, us, who disrupted and destroyed these civilizations, conquered their lands, committed genocidal slaughter against the indigenous people, forced millions of Africans into enslavement to become machines of production in a parasitic form of slavery-based agriculture created to enrich and profit the white ruling class and colonial white society as a whole through brutal backbreaking labor necessary for the production of sugar, cotton, tobacco, coffee, rice, and other resources. So all white people who are concerned about the environment, we cannot continue to delude ourselves with false solutions that do nothing but shift the focus of capitalist industry away from fossil fuels and towards other forms of energy that require brutally stealing resources like lithium from colonized peoples. No amount of paper straws, electric cars, or ludicrous political reforms that keep the colonial capitalist system intact will ever make a dent in undoing the life-threatening environmental crisis created by imperialist white power. Only when Africa is free, when the African working class is liberated and has power over their own lives, lands, and resources, will the earth be able to heal. Only when colonial capitalism is defeated and reparations are paid to African and colonized peoples for centuries of oppression and exploitation that continues to this day. So the Uhuru Solidarity Movement calls on white people to join in solidarity with the African Revolution by organizing our own communities for reparations to African people, the return of the stolen wealth into the hands of the anti-colonial struggle of the African and colonized peoples of the world for freedom, independence, and power. You can join USM at uhurusolidarity.org. Thank you again to the organizers of this important webinar and salute to the leadership of the African working class and unity through reparations. Uhuru. Thank you, Jesse. The next commenter is uh, Universal Africans People Organization, Zaki Baroudi. Uh, first of all, let me say uh, good evening and power to the people. Um, let me just, it's, uh, uh, it's so much has been said, it's nothing much I can say. I just truly appreciate what Jesse, his analysis that he just projected was so right on time because the bottom line after we deal with uh, agriculture as a weapon of destruction is that capitalism just has to be uh, taken out of existence and we have a whole new transformation of a, a society that's based on uh, peace, justice and equality for everybody. But also as we were looking at uh, talking about land, it's so much power that was discussed this evening but my mind drifted to two issues. Uh, it drifted to uh, Zimbabwe, in fact, right next door to uh, South Africa, where there was a, uh, uh, under the leadership of Robin Mugabe, uh, where reappropriating the lands that had been taken from the native uh, African on that soil of uh, Zimbabwe. And as an extension of them taking the land from the white colonialists, that uh, the United States placed some uh, severe sanctions on uh, Zimbabwe that to this day still exist. So if we don't be true to the revolution, then uh, we have to multiply our numbers and bring an end to uh, this system that uh, just dehumanizes human beings, especially black people across the country. Also, I know agriculture depends on water and my mind went to Flint, Missouri, uh, Flint Michigan where you had the, you know, the uh, corporate America allowing uh, the water to be uh, poisoned by lead and impacting, uh, you know, pre predominantly black people in the uh, city of Flint. So the bottom line, and when you hear from uh, the brother out of India and just across the globe, the masses of people are suffering because of capitalism. And I always like to use the example of the old Dracula movies. This will continue to exist until we have a stake through the heart of Dracula and Dracula is capitalism and imperialism. So uh, liberation in our lifetime, uh, those who know that there needs to be a true transformation 
You got to double your efforts or triple your efforts at organizing people to bring the downfall of, uh, of this, of capitalism and imperialism. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baruti. Jack Lawrence, you asked to comment. I'm sorry, Frank Lawrence. Okay, I wanted to circle back and mention that the Wikipedia uh, idea might be something that we could do as a group that would, uh, would disseminate the information a little faster than having to rely on published books. And uh, so I was throwing that in. Some of the other ideas that, that I had in addition to the lawn idea was, uh, ob obviously we need to reforest our planet. We should be talking in terms of planting trillions of trees. The land that is not earmarked for other purposes probably should have whatever uh, can grow on it growing. And we need to expand our uh, wetland systems because our water levels are rising across the globe and many of the, uh, many of the beach Coastal areas will be inundated with flooding, so they need to move to higher ground and they need to be rezoned. And we need uh, strips of protective wetlands between the ocean and the people. And uh, we need to quit shining all those darn lights up into the night sky that serve no useful purpose at all, but it consumes vast amounts of energy for about half of our day. And of course, we need to expand the uh, non carbon types of energy generation, the solar, the wind, the tidal, and so forth. And we should forget, for goodness sakes, we should forget about going to Mars and terraforming Mars when we have a planet here that could be terraformed um, instead. So those, those are just a few more ideas. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Lawrence. I'm gonna call again for um, Lynn Stewart Organizations, Ralph Pointer. Okay, are there any other co-sponsoring organizations that would like to make a comment? Chris? Hello, I was listening. This is Ralph Pointer. I'm a, 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 a Luddite in terms of uh, this new um, media uh, to handle a computer and a cell phone, et cetera. So I apologize for taking a moment to answer. Uh, yes, uh, this is a, a wonderful presentation of the realities of food as a weapon. But we must not forget the basic element of imperialism is physical violence. And along with the food, uh, if we go back to the 1800s, when Europeans were coming into America with the expansion westward, there was a $200 bounty on indigenous people. Now, how much was $200 in those days to begin your farming project? Free land plus a government subsidy and the government subsidy was based on death, killing of indigenous people. And we cannot forget the basic element that was involved in imperialism, colonialism. Um, it was the death of those who occupied the land previously. And it was the continued death of the folks, the farmers of Africa who were brought to this country to continue the farming for the imperialist colonialist governments. And so we must understand this is a fundamental part of colonialism, the death of others. And so that being real, what we must do is along with the uh, speaking and the understanding of food as a terrorist element or the lack of food as a terrorist element, we must understand that self-defense must be taught to 
the farming population. So today, let me advance forward to the day. We talk about the destruction of the land, the type of plowing, the problem with destroying the land to, um, in, in, to increase production. Mr. Pointer, yes. this, is, this is the moderator. Thank you so much. We've got two more speakers lined up. I appreciate you getting in on the, on the call and making your comments. If you want to wrap up, that'd be great. I will wrap up. Today, we have farmers, uh, um, Mennonites and Amish coming in the land that was controlled and destroyed by the American farmer to have production to rebuild that land. And the thing that is missing still is the understanding. And so, yes, it can be regained. It can no longer be used. Yes, it is continually used when we have the food deserts in the inner city. But this is a part of reclaiming of the land. It can be reclaimed, but along with the reclamation of the land by the farmers, we have to have reclamation of our humanity by bringing in self-defense. Thank you for the time to, to, to allow this presentation. It's been a wonderful program. I've listened to every word and I'm waiting for that, that input of the necessity of self-defense of the land and the people. Thank you again. Thank you, Mr. Porter. Pointer. Alliance for Sustainable Communities. Farah Farbag, would you speak, please? Uh, yes. Um, hello. Um, my name is Faramaris Farbud, and I want to thank uh, Don Fitz for alerting me to this webinar and permitting my the organization I'm representing, Alliance for Sustainable Community Lehigh Valley, to express its support and solidarity with all the people who are involved in this webinar from Africa to the United States and elsewhere. So I, I suppose I would say just a few words about who we are. We are um, Alliance for Sustainable Community. It's been around since 2003 and we envision a sustainable regenerative society based on enduring wisdom and careful stewardship. Now, uh, I myself, I'm also a founder of um, a working group of Alliance, which is uh, called Beyond Capitalism Working Group, and we have a publication called Left Turn that looks like this. It's a quarterly journal of critical voices, and I invite some of you, if you're willing to write for it, I would love to have that. And just to tell you um, a bit about what we believe, which is in line with everybody else's comments, we also think global capitalism's race to the bottom and for the bottom line is not just generating a runaway inequality problem, but social unrest, political dysfunctionality, race off the ecological cliff in the near future. And I think um, the kind of things that people have said that needs to be done, including um, um, highlighting the uh, struggles of agricultural workers, peasants, more than 2 billion people, is enormously important in any kind of serious politics we think should identify the institutional structure of global capitalism, the unconstrained logic of capital as factors that are most responsible for destroying the environmental basis of organized human life. We should expose capital's tendency to subsume science under its own narrow logic of accumulation and strive to disrupt the system in all the ways that we can in order to um, I'll give a possibility for a livable future. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> David Finkel, would you like to speak? Uh, hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Good, thank you. Um, on behalf of uh, my organization, Solidarity, we uh, greatly appreciate the, uh, the invitation to be a co-sponsor uh, for this uh, important discussion. Um, I think, um, Briefly, we should also um, keep in mind and salute the folks uh, in northern Minnesota, the indigenous water protectors and allies who have been fighting to resist the ecocidal um, end bridge line three. Um, I don't want to go too much uh, more into that, but uh, just to connect a couple of um, a couple of things. Early on, um, uh, someone uh, uh, someone referenced the. Uh, uh, the work of James Scott that that uh, Professor Jackson was talking about, 
on his book uh, against the grain documents something that really struck me which is that agriculture the agricultural revolution from the very beginning with all the possibilities that it opened up actually entailed for large parts of the uh, population a reduction of living standards a reduction of health um, and a uh, reduction in in nutrition as they were forced into uh, as, as they were basically forced into labor for the new agricultural system and in fact when city states collapsed uh, and they uh, rose up in revolt or fled for many of for much of the population it was an advance rather than a collapse now what's happened the system of capitalist production that we have today uh, even though it's only a few centuries old has raised the all the contradictions uh, and and levels of exploitation to whole new levels and um, obviously we know that we cannot go back to uh, the hunter forager society of um, tens of thousands of years ago um, but to grapple with this contradiction and to find a way out of it um, i really think that the comments that joan mckiernan made before uh, really hit the nail on the head um, that there has to be a fund fundamental democratization and uh, that uh, depends on the struggles of all the workers of the world, including agricultural workers, industrial workers, service workers, and everybody else. So I'd like to thank uh, Joan for, for those comments that I really solidarize with. Thank you. Thank you, David. Lizzie of the Green Party of Florida, would you like to speak next? Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention our thanks to you all for putting this on. This is extremely important. Um, Greens, we've been working on food sovereignty. We had uh, the Coalition of Mockley Workers on for that, as well as um, uh, Indigenous peoples across the, the nation. And we're working on food and agriculture. And we are in support of our Florida farm workers and their efforts for fair food and against modern day slavery. And also the most recent, um, a situation is the new fracking drill site that is um, planned for right in <laughs> really uh, in the town of Immokalee um, and in their watershed and the big Cypress watershed that uh, flows to the Florida tribes um, of our indigenous peoples. So uh, this is a continuing effort and uh, we all uh, have to keep uh, working in solidarity with those on the front lines. Thanks. Thank you. I'm out of the, do we have any other co-sponsoring organizations that would like to make a comment? We have Chris Mann of uh, the Green Party Action Committee. Two minutes. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, the Peace Action Committee of the Green Party is uh, abbreviated GPACS. people in uh, the environment. So toward that in, in the uh, Peace Action Committee is sponsoring a webinar November 18th. I'll put it in the chat, the link to it. Um, uh, it is called Nonviolence in a Violent World, Making a Difference Through Direct. Um, the confirmed speakers are uh, Jill Stein, uh, the Green Party presidential candidate of 2012 and 16. Henry Stover is a person spearheading um, in Kansas City the fight against nuclear weapons plant that makes all the triggers in Kansas City. Christopher Valesquez, he's from Veterans for Peace a speaker from Extinction Rebellion, and Ajamu Baraka from Black Alliance for Peace. 
So um, if you're interested in co-sponsoring that forum on the 18th, please put your name in the chat and your email. And also we're looking for resistance fighters. Um, so you can also sign on to the webinar to have, have, have them come. So thank thanks so much. Thank you, Chris. Any other comments from co-sponsoring organizations? I want to give a special, they're hearing none. I think we're at the end of our webinar. Um, Don or Barb, if you'd like to make a comment, but I'd like to thank Dr. Fields, JD, Dr. West for everything you've done. Amazing work. Uh, Barbara, Don, you want to say something to close? Okay, yeah, now we're unmuted. I want to remind everybody that if you're on this, you're going to get an invitation to um, participate in the December 1st webinar. Uh, so I, I hope every there we had a lot of different co-sponsoring organizations make a comment. I hope that everybody reaches out to their, uh, mem not just endorses, but reaches out to their membership and their contacts to participate in the December 1st webinar. We're going to go more intensely into several of the issues that were brought up tonight. So please, you, you will get a copy of the recording and you will, uh, in the middle of November, you'll get an invitation to participate on December 1st. So please respond to that and tell us you'd like to, like to co-sponsor and like to participate in, in the event on December 1st. Thank you. To, uh, good morning to JD. Good night to everyone else. Thank you for attending the webinar. Good job. Good job, speakers. Good night. <laughs> in one contact I guess that is good <laughs>